Well, good morning. How are you doing? Good. I uh, apparently don't know the password to my computer. Now I do. Good. Good, good. I hope you guys had a good Christmas. I, I trust that you did. Me and my family, we had a great time. Our son is 14 months, and so he was super into wrapping paper and tissue paper. So that made it for a bargain Christmas for us, but it really was a lot um, of fun. So when I was in seminary, uh, one of my preaching professors told, told us that a good way to start a sermon is by creating some tension, right? And we see this happen in, in movies and books. And so to create some tension for you this morning and possibly uh, accidentally raise our blood pressure, I'm just going to read you a list of various events that happened in 2020. Does that sound good? Let's go down memory lane from this year. Australian brush fires, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle quit the royal family, COVID-19 pandemic, Kobe Bryant's death, impeachment of Donald Trump, Harvey Weinstein indictment, stock market crash, Black Lives Matter protests, Kim Jong-un death rumors, Biden wins the Democratic nomination, murder hornets arrive in the U.S. Had no idea about that, by the way. Hope no one got stung by one. Beirut explosion, Kamala Harris announces Joe Biden's running mate, West Coast wildfire, Chadwick Boseman's death, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death, President Trump tests positive for COVID-19, Joe Biden becomes... President-elect COVID-19 vaccine, and just two days ago, Nashville bombing. And then finally, pictures with Santa behind plexiglass. There you go. So that was, uh, we, we felt like we had to get uh, Wells's, my son's first picture with Santa Claus this year, because what better way to commemorate 2020 than having him forever wonder why he had to sit like six feet away from Santa Claus when he was one years old, but that's neither here nor there. But what a time to be alive. I mean, this year, am I right? And of course, that's also not to mention just the personal hardships that many of us have experienced this year. Death, addiction, disease, sickness, job loss, financial loss. This has been a year for the record books. And when I think and when I reflect upon this year, and I would encourage you to do the same in these last couple days, but when I have thought about this year, I can't help but see some congruency between this year, 2020, and Jewish exile, right? And now that's not to over-dramatize 2020 or minimize Jewish exile. I know it's not a perfect comparison, but when I hold up the mirror to 2020, I can't help but see some reflection of the exile and of that time period that we read about in the Old Testament. And just in case you're a little unfamiliar, you need some brushing up on the exile. And around, in around, around 605 BC, Babylon basically overthrew Israel and forced them to move into exile, forced them to move away from their homes to Babylon. And and despite dozens and dozens of warnings from God himself that, hey, if you don't uphold this covenant that we have made, if you don't remain faithful to me and if you continue to be disobedient, I will eventually turn my back on you and leave you to your fate. And in this instance, the fate that they were left to was being overtaken and exiled to Babylon, right? And basically, as we know, that, that they relinquished the comfort and security of their home, families were torn apart, virtually overnight, they were forced to create new normals and to relearn how to live life. And I think two words that you could use to describe exile would be disorienting and unknown. And guess what two words I think you could use to describe this year that we've all journeyed through? A little disorienting and a lot of unknowns. And so I want us to look at the 29th chapter of Jeremiah. And like Richard said, this morning will be a little different. We'll read it in two parts. But I want to start in verse 4, and then we'll go to verse 10. But what we're reading here in Jeremiah is basically a letter from Jeremiah. He was a prophet. He's speaking on behalf of God, as prophets do. And he's writing to those who are already in Babylon, already in exile. There was kind of three waves of, of exiles that were sent. He's probably writing to the first Wave, And so these people have just freshly been kicked out of their homes and are being forced to live in a new and strange place. And this is Jeremiah's words to them on behalf of God. It begins in verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. 
Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in numbers too. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because when it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. There's a lot of things to to note in that passage, but really what I notice, especially when thinking about this year, is the pace of that passage. The pace, the the P-A- C-E. And the pace of Jeremiah writing to those in exiles is not, is not in a rush. It's not expedited. In fact, if it were me and probably you and probably them who were hearing this for the first time, we would prefer the pace of this to seem urgent and quick. We would probably have preferred Jeremiah to say something like, hey, don't get too comfortable. Don't worry about it. You'll be here for just a couple months, maybe a year at most, and then things will return to normal and you'll be right back at home enjoying the comforts and the rhythms of your life that you have come to enjoy for so long. But what do we get instead from, instead from Jeremiah? Settle down. Settle down. And what's interesting about this is, I, I won't read it again, but it'll be behind me. Look at verses 8 and 9. It says, do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. And what's, what's of note about that is Jeremiah is likely talking just one chapter earlier about the false prophet Hananiah. This is Jeremiah 28. Read that later if you want. And what's crazy is that Hananiah actually falsely prophesied to them that they would only be in exile for maybe two years. And yet what does Jeremiah say? No, try 70. Try 68 more than what Hananiah is saying. Oh, but we, we want Hananiah. We want this to be quick. Settle down. Settle down here. Settle down in the uncertainty. Settle down in the lack of peace. And then it continues with build houses, seek the peace, seek the prosperity of the city, make this your new normal. And what's, what's interesting is about settling down, right? Settling down in this new and strange place is that we may be tempted to think of exile as just a historical setting, a historical timepiece, and it, it certainly is. But the reality is that we as Christ followers, exile is an internal displacement and disorientation that we are reminded of day in, day out, right? I, I had the, the privilege a couple weeks ago of, of talking about being a, a stranger, an alien to this place, and it's really that same idea, and that we are strangers to this world because we have been exiled, and we are waiting for Jesus to come to bring his kingdom on heaven as it is in earth. Exile is simply that longing that you have for pandemics and masks and disease and addictions and virtual learning, remote working to be put to rest, right? It's a reality that we are confronted with day in, day out. And so just like Jeremiah told those in exile in Babylon to settle down, I think it rings true for us. We have to learn to settle down in the uncertainty, to settle down in the disorientation and the unknowns. Because if it wasn't 2020, it'll probably be 2021. You know, that's the uncomfortable reality. For some of us, probably even in this room or online, 2020 will look like a walk in the park compared to 2021 or 2022 or 2023. But so long as this world is broken and not right and we have that feeling of exile, there is a season coming in each and every one of our lives where we will be forced to settle in to uncertainty. We'll be tempted to believe the Hananias that we can rush through this, but we ought to settle down like Jeremiah did. Judd, in just a minute, is, is going to continue. Judd and the guys are going to continue to lead us in worship. And I want to just give you a, a few prayer points or a few things that, that you can think through while you sit there. And, and the first is, if you haven't, just take a moment to reflect on this year. Take a moment to, to think through what, what have the last 12 months looked like in my year. Tell God what's been uncertain in your life. 
And obviously he knows, he knows what's been uncertain, but sometimes it just helps to vocalize those things. Even if you're kind of doing it in your head so you don't seem like a crazy person talking out loud, but you're welcome to do that here. But he knows, he knows what you've experienced this year, but sometimes it's just good practice to say those things, to say them aloud or aloud in your head so you recognize, okay, God knows. God knows. I know that I have made this present before God, and he knows the uncertainty and the anxiety that I have felt this year, and it's nothing I have to attempt to hide anymore. So tell God what's been uncertain in your life. Ask God, am I trying to rush through anything? Am I trying to expedite something that was never meant to be expedited, but instead the Lord may be leading me to settle in to that uncertainty? And finally, that's that's too pessimistic for you. Ask the Lord to reveal what have been some of the greatest victories in this year for you. But if you do that, also ask the Lord to reveal what have some of your defeats been this year. So take a moment. I'll come back up. I promise verse 11 is coming. You know that one. You like it. And so there is hope. But for now, if you don't mind, settle in that tension. Would you stand, please, as we worship? song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus Jesus the name above every other name your heart 
I will build. my wisdom.
Lord, that is the cry of our heart. Lord, that your vision for our life, Lord, your vision for our families, for our marriages, your vision for our church, your vision for Richardson, Lord, is our vision. Lord, that we see life through your eyes, that we see hope through your eyes, that we see peace through your eyes. Lord, and because of that, we share our stories, we share our testimony, we share our salvation to a world that desperately needs relationship with you. Lord, so we thank you for that opportunity just to pour those words out to you, that cry that our vision is your vision. So we thank you for this moment. We praise you for this moment. In Jesus' mighty, holy, and precious name. Amen. Amen. So Jeremiah's letter to those in exile continues in verse 11 and through 14. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I've banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. So here's the beauty of life with God. That even in our exile, even in our moments of uncertainty, even in our 2020s, he still has a plan and a hope and a future for us. And, and the Israelites, despite their disobedience, despite their inability to uphold the covenant which they had agreed upon with God, despite numerous second, third, fourth, fifth, tenth chances, even while they were in exile, even while they were far from God, they got to hear God say, I still have a hope for you. I still have a future for you. So do we... Do we settle down in our uncertainty? Yeah. Do we, do we still recognize that, that, as it says in Romans 8, 22, that, that the world is groaning in pain? Yeah. But do we also recognize that even in the midst of the darkest of hours, even in the midst of the most disorienting moments that life could possibly present to us, do we still find that God is with us? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We do, and I, and I love I love verse eleven, and you probably do too. We love it on college graduation cards. We love it on like repurposed wood painted, all cute from from Magnolia and, and supporting the Joanna Gaines Empire. We love it on on mugs. But but the problem with Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, when taken out of context, you don't really get the full flavor of it. And so I am suggesting, I am suggesting that we put a disclaimer on anything that just has Jeremiah twenty nine eleven by itself on it. In fact, I'm working on a prototype of a coffee mug. I think I've got a, a picture of it. What it'll say is, while you are completely disoriented, lost, confused, and living in a strange reality, the Lord has a plan for you to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And, and that's, that's what I want to get all of our seniors in high school. Because when you're a senior in high school, I, I've watched kids, kids round this corner many times. When you're a senior in high school, you don't need that disclaimer. You're all like, heck yeah, God has a plan for me and it's going to be awesome and I'm going to get to college and I'm going to kick butt and it's going to be great. But then fast forward to your freshman, the conversations I have with them, they're sitting on their bed midway through their first semester, their freshman year, they're weeping because they have no friends, they're homesick, they hate their major, they're not even sure if they want to return for their spring semester. And in those moments, that's especially when God has that plan for you, that hope for you. And so I, I apologize. If, if I just ruined verse 11 for you, I, I'm kind of sorry. I don't think I ruined it because I think it's even more sweeter when we understand that what God is trying to tell us, that even in the chaos, I still have that plan for you. I still have that hope for you. I still have that future for you. Even in that first semester of college, even after the job loss, after the pandemic, after the financial loss, even in the midst of the addiction, God still has a plan for you. And that's because God is Emmanuel. God is, is with us. God is incarnate. And over the last 14 months, the, the Lord has, has taught me a lot of, about this idea of God being incarnate. 
and it's something we celebrate uh, a lot this time of year with, with Christmas. But, but long story short, uh, my, my son, who's now 14 months and is, is beautiful, healthy, you saw him a minute ago, his first two months of life were not as such. We, we had some, some dark moments, some scary moments, a, a really early surgery with him. But throughout that, that season of life, God taught me what it means for God to be incarnate. And, and in, incarnate incarnation is just a fancy theological term of remembering that God through his son Jesus put on human flesh and lived and breathed on this earth just like you and I are doing now. And in doing that, in being incarnate, it made possible what the writer of Hebrews says in the fourth chapter, verse 15, one of my all-time, if not my, my favorite verse. I know we're not supposed to have favorite verses, Judd, but I have one. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So God knows, he knows what we feel. He has lived and breathed every moment of 2020. He knows at a deep, deep level the victories you've experienced over the last 360 whatever days. And he knows the defeats. He knows the dark moments as well. And he's not scared by them. And in fact, as that scripture says, he goes one step further than just knowing. He doesn't just know and not care. He knows and he empathizes empathizes with you. Like, let that sink in. Maybe that's all we need to talk about this morning, is that God empathizes with us, and especially in our weakness and in our moments of exile, because he is incarnate, he is Emmanuel, he is with us. And 2020 in exile may be marked by disorientation and unknown, but I promise you, life with God is marked by orientation and being known. And that, that is a beautiful, beautiful reality that we get to step into. That God knows us and that he wants to know us, that he wants to empathize with us, that he wants to be near to us. And sometimes, and perhaps you've, you've experienced this, um, for me it was at the tail end of, of 2019 when my son was born, but sometimes when we walk through an exile-like year, our disorientation is what leads us to our reorientation. And so I think for a lot of us, we have realized this year that we probably put too much faith, too much hope in things that really never were, were meant to, to take our faith and to take our hope. And through this year, watching those things fade away, we have been reoriented towards the things that really matter. We have been reoriented, hopefully, towards the heart of God. And, and by the way, maybe for some of you, you didn't know that there's a God who wants to know you, like, like really wants to know you. And it would be, it would be my my pleasure, like seriously, to talk to you or, or anyone on our staff to talk to you about how there's this God who wants to know you. And in fact, he went so far and wants to know you so badly that he sent his son, that's that incarnation thing we talked about, to die upon a cross for your sake. That's the length in which God went so he could have a relationship and so he could know you. And so if you've never, if you've never heard that or if you don't know him in that way and you didn't know that he wants to know you, we would love to have a conversation with you. I'll be back at that room and several of our pastors, or if you're online, man, just mention something on there and we would love, love to have that conversation with you about the God who wants to know you and wants to orient you. And so as we, as we wrap up, and as we, as we sort of close out before we'll, we'll worship with one more song. But I asked the question in the first little part up here is, is kind of how do we settle down in the uncertainty? You know, I think that's what Jeremiah tells us. We settle down in the uncertainty. And if I can be totally honest, I, I don't really know. I'm, I'm a lot better at asking questions I don't know the answer to. <laughs> I don't fully know. I don't really know how you find peace in the uncertainty. You can Google it. You'll probably find some, some cool like Christian mommy blogger who has like a five-step process. And, and that's awesome. That might work for you. I don't mean to hate on Christian mommy bloggers. But, but what I do know and what I do feel confident with is that God is with us in that uncertainty. And he walks with us. He crawls with us if we're at the pace of crawling. 
But either way, when we settle into that uncertainty, we settle in next to a God who is incarnate, who is empathetic, and who is with us. That's the God of this place. That's the God that we celebrate. That's the God that we've been celebrating this whole week. A God that no matter what uncertain moments you find yourself in, you also find that God right next to you. And that's a beautiful picture of a God who wants to know you. And so Judd is going to, and, and the rest of the gang, is, is going to sing uh, a song that, I, as far as Judd and I know, is, is pretty new to this place. Um, and it's an old hymn, and the main lyric is, All glory be to Christ our King. And I think as we kind of close out, this is the last corporate worship service as the year, as we just sort of put a period on this year, we are going to put a period through singing that in spite of everything that happened in 2020, and regardless of what happens in 2021, all glory be to Christ our King. A God who is with us, even in the darkest of dark, that is a God who is good, and because he is good, he deserves glory. And let's just be honest for a moment. We don't know what this year has. You know, you think back to this time a year ago, we felt pretty confident about 2020, right? It was gonna be like any other year. And now look, now look where we're at 365 days later. So we don't know what this year holds. I, I'm optimistic, I'm hopeful, but we don't know. But what we do know is that no matter what happens, when we stand up here one year from now, all glory will still belong to Christ our Amen. King.